Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Abhishek Motru, and I'm one of TKERM student education co-leads. Uh, and I'm very happy to be moderating today's Temerity Center speaker series with Dr. Jessica bergner -Kars. Uh First off, we'll start off with a quick land acknowledgement. Um, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, um, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Temerty Center for AI Research and Education Medicine at the University of Toronto has been made possible by the generous donation of the Temerty family, and TKERM is an independent center that serves as a focal point for collaboration among healthcare providers, uh, trainees, researchers, computer scientists, engineers, and industry. And our goal is to transform health through AI, and uh, this event is CPD accredited. So to obtain your CPD credit, please complete the evaluation form via the QR code uh, or link that uh, uh, will be put up at the end of the session. And don't forget to um, provide your name and email address on the evaluation form. And note to the attendees, uh, please use the uh, Q&A function uh, in the Zoom chat to submit your uh, questions for Dr. Bergner Kars, and she will address them during the discussion portion of this webinar. And by attending this event, you're consenting to being photographed or recorded for non-commercial use by TKRM. And uh, uh, let me just quickly introduce Dr. Jessica Bergner Kars before we get started. Uh, so Dr. Jessica Bergner Kars' research focus uh, lies on continuum robots, and in particular on their design, modeling, planning and control, as well as human-robot interaction. Her fundamental robotics research is driven by applications in minimally invasive surgery and maintenance, repair, and operations. And in this talk, Dr. Jessica bernard Karst will review the landscape of interventional and surgical continuum robots, both in research and medical products. And she will discuss advances in continuum robot design, state-of-the-art physics-based and emerging learning-based modeling methods as well as motion planning and control. And she will touch on current projects at the Continuum Robotics Laboratory and elaborate on the opportunity space for next generation medical Continuum robots. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Abby. I'm gonna quickly start sharing my screen. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, very happy to be here today. Thank you for um, T. Karim for giving me the opportunity to, um, to give a lecture um, today. So before we um, start off, I want to quickly declare that I have uh, no conflicts of interests. So this is pure me as a professor at the University of Toronto uh, talking about my research. And I want to start us off with a question. So all of you, please think about how does a surgical robot look like? So what is your first surgical robot system that comes to your mind when you hear this question? I would take bets. Um, the vast majority of you probably thought about the Da Vinci uh, surgical system from intuitive surgical that we see here depicted, depicted on this slide. This has been a great success because it brought surgical robotics to I think over 70 countries and they performed over 9 million procedures to date. And it is a very convenient system. So you have these uh, four, up to four robot arms that are situated above uh, the patient, and then they are used for uh, um, laparoscopic uh, surgeries. Here you see um, a nurse that is uh, preparing the robot for the intervention, and then the physician or even two physicians would be um, conveniently located in a console teleoperating the robot, so pretty much commanding the robot what to do with different input devices, and they have endoscopic vision into the abdomen. This is arguably beneficial of uh, for the patient because laparoscopic surgery um, with all its benefits would apply here. Um, and it's very convenient for a physician because they are uh, nicely seated and not like in weird body postures um, above the patient. So this surgical robot system has been around for over 20 years and it really paved the way for optimism and also a lot of resources in surgical robotics uh, research for all of us. Now, when I think about a 
surgical robot. I'm thinking this further and wonder if we had a medical robot or a surgical robot that resembled similar uh, mechanical features, so having these like snake-like instruments, almost like worms, uh, we could use these small scale surgical robots to do all sorts of things that the common ex um, existing surgical robots couldn't do. Let's think about the, the anatomical regions we see here on this slide for a moment. For example, up here, we see the pituitary gland right at the center of our brain, which is often a region for tumors to develop. So you could enter it there through the nose using such a slender snake-like robot and operate on this tumor. And you would need to overcome this pretty much non-linear curve trajectory. The same holds if you think about um, regions that are deep seated within the lung, they could be suspicious for some cancer and you would want to take a biopsy. But rather than doing it from the outside, you could think about going through the bronchi and through the airways all the way to the location where you would want to take this biopsy. And such a small scale surgical robot could be really helpful. And now with all these uh, regions we see here on this slide, they have a lot of things in common. They are very hard to reach. You have to overcome some tortuous paths to get there while respecting task and anatomical constraints. And with that in mind and these um, snake-like instruments, um, that's pretty much why I devoted my research career to continuum robots. And that's how I ended up here today giving this lecture to you. Now let's quickly think about what are the learning objectives for today, for those of you that take this for credit. So after the end of this lecture today, I would like us all to be able to um, identify a continuum robot when we see one. I want us all to be able to describe medical use cases or potential use cases for continuum robots. And I would like us to get an understanding of the challenges that are associated with using continuum robots in medicine. Now, to start us off, um, in, for us to be able to identify a continuum robot, we need to define what it is to begin with. So a continuum robot is an actuatable structure that makes it a robot, in, in fact. And the constitutive material forms a curve with continuous tangent vector. Now, this may be a little bit mathematical for some of you, but I guess where I'm hitting at is so the body of this robot would be, we would be able to um, describe it with a curve in space. And then these continuum robots, they can bend, often uh, extend and contract, and sometimes even twist along their length. So it's a slender body. Usually one dimension is uh, much larger than the other two, meaning the length is usually much longer than the diameter. Typically in medical application, we see diameters uh, around a few millimeters. And the length is about 20 to 30 centimeters for the robot to be able to reach various locations within a patient. And so as we can build those very small scale, they are very, um, yeah, very promising for a lot of medical tasks. I would like to mention, though, in my research lab, we not only focus on the medical application side of things, but also on industrial applications. But I will skip this part today and focus on small scale uh, continuum robots. The first continuum robot I would like to show you is this one that we have built uh, in uh, my lab and other researchers worldwide are working on as well. So this is a so-called concentric tube continuum robot. It is composed of these telescoping tubes. They are very thin, super elastic nickel titanium tubes, a material we often see in medical instruments. And it has a diameter at its tip of about 2.5 millimeters. So it has this needle-like scale. Some of you may be able to tell the actuation happens at the back end. So these tubes are grabbed and then they are translated and rotated with respect to one another. And this is how we can achieve this tentacle-like motion in this robot. And you can probably see with such a very small scale, slender and dexterous uh, robot, we could do all sorts of medical uh, interventions with it. For example, we could go through the nose and reach the skull base, or we could enter the, uh, the brain through a very small incision on the skull. And the good thing about this type of robot is that we can um, design the robot and the tubes in a way that it suits the anatomy. So if we have knowledge about what is the, um, what is the anatomical constraints, what is the um, disease we're trying to treat, what, are, what is the pathology, then we can define the curvature and the parameters of this tube such that we can um, attain this, um, this workspace that is required to do this uh, task. 
A great feature of this robot is that it is uh, already made out of material that is um, biocompatible. We can integrate different tools through the center of the tubes. We could integrate laser fibers. We could add small scale cameras, forceps, correts. So this is readily um, possible to use this robot for medical applications. And this is to date the smallest of all continuum robots we can build in terms of diameter. So this gives you a very good idea about what is the smallest scale uh, we can do. Now, there are some specialties with this type of robot because the motion that we're seeing, this tentacle-like motion, results from the elastic interaction of these tubes with one another. So there's quite an intricate um, um, mechanical behavior that we need to understand in order to make these robots do what we want to do. And yet we don't have too much control over the curvatures we can achieve because they very much depend on how we choose these tubes to be pre-curved and used. That is different in the second type of continuum robot I'm showing you here. This is a so-called tendon-driven continuum robot. Now I'm showing this without any sleeve, just that you see how it looks on the inside. So there's a central um, elastic uh, backbone. And then you see, and we use red tendons here, uh, red tendons routed along this backbone and they are pulled or tensioned on the back end. And that way we can induce these bending moment, motions that we're seeing here. There are different segments that we can control independently. And so the robot can be moved and we can control the curvatures of this robot uh, very well. The diameter of this robot is a little bigger because we have to integrate the tendons and be able to induce large enough bending moments. So the diameter here is six uh, millimeters, so quite a bit larger uh, as the previous one. But in relationship to the hand, you still see it's a small scale and very useful for um, entering the human body through small incisions or natural orifices. Now we have different versions of this robots with extensible segments and twisting segments, but this gives you a good idea about the um, possibilities here. What you can also see from the interaction with this, with this hand is that the robot is flexible and elastic, meaning it is somewhat safe to be used within a human body because it cannot necessarily harm anything because it will actually move out of the way if it experiences contact with an environment, which is a great feature of continuum robots, which makes them so promising in medicine. Now, I could use the remainder of the talk to tell you about all the different continuum robot designs that are researched worldwide. And I am um, made a bit of an effort to put some very exciting um, continuum robot designs here on this slide um, from various research groups. Um, for example, here we see a handheld uh, continuum robot, which is also using these small scale tubes and can be pretty much handled like a surgical instrument. And there's this trackball here to um, operate the tip. There's also these like um, flexible instruments like we see down here at a very small scale. You can um, just uh, attain different tip motions, very dextrate motions. There's also bimanual systems that are researched, dual arm devices for bimanual uh, manipulation. For example, here for a single port system where you have two continuum robot arms deploying out of a laparoscope. And there's all sorts of small scale um, use cases, for example, um, here you could use um, um, continuum robots also to steer through vasculature, and I'm going to get to this uh, in a little while today. Um, or you could use it to move through a very constrained environment like here. This is a, um, a, a glass bulb, but um, it resembles a little bit the, um, the um, anatomical, um, I guess, environment you would see in a urological um, use case. And you get an idea there's a vast universe of continuum robots. And they all have in common what we spoke about when we talked about what is a continuum robot. They have this continuous appearance, right? All of these continuum robotic instruments that you see here on the slide can be approximately, uh, approximated with a continuous curve in space. And that makes them a continuum robot as opposed to um, other robot types. Now you may think, okay, all this is great, but how are you actually gonna use this robot in surgery? I see them all moving around, but I have a hard time understanding how would um, a physician now use this kind of robot. And that's where um, I guess a big portion of our research comes in, in the Continuum Robotics Lab that I'm directing. We are focusing on a lot of fundamental research um, that is looking into modeling and controlling these robots from, I guess, more engineering computer science perspective. 
And we work a lot with different collaborators and also uh, clinicians to translate our fundamental findings then into um, use cases in, in medicine. And in the following, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, challenges we're facing in modeling and control, and then how we can use our understanding of a continuum robot's motion behavior in um, a simple teleoperation use case, which could already lead to a, a medical application. So when we look at this here, so um, I guess we are still interested in obtaining this curve that describes the shape of this robot, because ultimately, if we want to use the robot within a patient or any environment, pretty much, we need to be able to understand what is the actual behavior of the robot under certain actuations at the back end, but probably also under um, all sorts of interactions with the environment as the robot may come in contact with, um, with different tissues and stuff. So in modeling, there are different ways uh, to go about this. We usually take a physics-based approach and we try to approximate the behavior of the robot through um, different relationships. For example, we could approximate the shape of this robot by a series of constant curvature arcs. And we could describe each arc with different parameters like the curvature, the radius, and the bending angle. And then we can conc concatenate these arcs to approximate the behavior of the robot. And this is a simple and yet effective model, as long as the robot is not subject to any external loads. As soon as it becomes subject to external loads, the shape functions we would need to use would need to be more sophisticated. And there are different ways to use all sorts of modal functions that I don't want to bore you with um, during this lecture today. I just want to give you an idea about what are the different, um, I guess, complexities of models we could use. The ultimate model applies a variable curvature approach where we pretty much describe any point along the length of our robot with the associated um, strains. And with that, we can integrate the curve and understand what is the material orientation and also the position. So we very much have an understanding of the whole shape of the robot. And if we calibrate such a model very well, there's a rule of thumb that I would like you to remember. That is, we can be accurate um, looking at the tip of the robot. So if you want to say, where's the tip of the robot under certain actuation and external forces it's experiencing, we can be accurate up to 1.5 to 3% with respect to the robot's length. This is a common uh, measure we use in continuum robotics because the longer the robot gets, the harder it is actually to predict where the tip is. So let's do a little example here. If the robot is 30 centimeters long, meaning we get an error of about four millimeters, four and a half millimeters at the tip with this type of modeling. You may argue, oh, this is not very accurate. What if I need to be um, much more accurate than a few millimeters in my surgical applications? Um, we will get to this in a minute when we talk about control and sensing and how we can actually close the loop and make this more accurate. But for now, this is what it is. And you may think like, oh, but industrial robots that we use in industrial automation, they are way more accurate. And that is true because they are usually stiff systems, right? They have rigid links and joints and the, um, the motion behavior can be predicted much, much easier. So um, here, because the robot is elastic and can move, uh, we cannot expect the same level of accuracy. And so while this may seem bad, it's actually a good feature of this robot. We can increase the um, accuracy quite a bit by using learning-based approaches. And that's probably the first time I'm, I'm talking a little bit about AI methods today. In that, um, in these physics-based models, we often have to make a sort of assumptions to have them be able to compute in real time. Because when we want to control a robot in a patient, we want to know at every millisecond what is happening there. I want to control the robot at this high speed. So, we have to make certain assumptions. For example, we neglect friction, we neglect all sorts of things that are actually physically happening for it to be able to compute in real time. Now, if we want to know what is the ultimate accuracy, we figured let's do a learning-based approach. And rather than trying to physically model what the robot is doing, um, just collect um, a couple of data points, actually 100,000 data points of where, what is the shape of the robot? We use a sensor to measure discrete points along the robot. And then we just jog the actuators to so the pulling or pushing on the tendons or the translation and rotation of tubes. We just jog it through 100,000 different combinations, measure what the robot actually looks like. And then we use um, a feed forward neural network to estimate, um, to actually generate this, this mapping. 
And what we found out is that the accuracy is actually much, much better as expected because this learning-based approach inherently models all these phenomena that we usually don't um, are not able to model. And it is much more accurate and goes down to below 0.5% with respect to lengths for some robot types. Meaning we get from this like four or five millimeters at the tip being off down to a millimeter. So that's actually quite encouraging. And yet there's often this conversation happening, well, a learning-based model is pretty much a black box model. You need to collect all this data. How can we use this in an actual product? So I guess the 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 truth or the future lies in some good combination of a physics and a learning-based model. Anyway, with this excursion into a model, and that's probably the most math heavy it gets today. So if you uh, were a little, little bit shocked already, um, that's about it. We're now going to go um, to a higher level and exploit. What can we do now that we have an understanding of how the robot behaves under actuation and external um, disturbances? We can exploit all sorts of motion capabilities that these robots have that are very um, interesting and important to exploit in the medical um, scenario. These robots have different abilities, and I'm showcasing some here on this slide. The robots can um, respect certain shape constraints, meaning a part of the robot body can remain constant while the tip continues to move. Let's think about this robot being in a very curved environment. Let's take the bronchi, for example, the airways. So you may want to have a certain part of the robot being fixed to not um, move around, while the tip may perform still a incision or um, do some medical imaging, all sorts of things. So this is interesting to exploit from a roboticist and also from an application standpoint. We are also exploring how the robot can essentially follow the curve of its tip. We call this follow the leader motion. And there are certain prerequisites that have to be met um, on, from an engineering standpoint to make this motion possible that would be important if you have a very narrow um, environment you want to navigate through. And then there's also work that we're doing on um, understanding um, how can we avoid obstacles or how can we make contact with obstacles for steering. So there are different ways we can now exploit the model to understand what would happen if we use the robot in a medical application. And while this is all more fundamental research that we're doing and maybe a little bit far off a medical application, um, I figure I'm going to go a little bit more about what would the actual use in, in, um, in a medical application look like. So we're looking at um, teleoperation mostly in, in medicine, right, where you have the physician being situated in a console um, sitting here nicely, having one hand or both hands on input devices. These are um, taking position and orientation information um, off the leader, which is the physician, into account. And then they feed this into this control loop that I'm showing, showing here. This is a model-based controller. So we use the understanding we have from the model I described previously, and then um, use the velocity that the leader is commanding um, determine what would be the actuation velocities we would need to command to the robot for the robot to actually follow the motion that the leader is, um, is prescribing. So this is called teleoperation. The physician is pretty much orchestrating the motion of the tip of the robot through these input devices. And the loop is closed by the physician themselves. They would see if the motion of the robot is how they wanted it to be. If it's not, they would correct the input device in certain directions. And it's actually quite remarkable how amazing the hand-eye coordination of physicians are. You could pretty much invert directions of this input device and they would be able to pick this up just because their hand-eye and also um, just spatial awareness is, is fantastic. So this is a very simple way to actually get our robots into a medical application. If you just leave the control to the physician. And these teleoperation scenarios, there's a vast um, application domain in which those could be used. And I'm going to showcase one in which I did research with and then talk about some commercial systems that they are deploying this teleoperation scheme as well. The example I want to give goes back to uh, one of the earlier um, visual, uh, vis um, visualizations I showed, and it's about the uh, pituitary uh, tumors that I talked about. 
Pituitary tumors are, as I said earlier, very much in the center of our brain. They are usually benign when they grow, uh, but they do grow in one of five people. And in some of us, they may grow, uh, these tumors may grow too large. And even though they're benign, they will need to be resected because you could, uh, could get all sorts of problems, for example, vision uh, issues, because the optic nerves are cross right here um, at the pituitary um, location. So how this is usually operated on is through a transnasal, transphenoidal, so you get a little incision in the sphenoid sinus here, and then you would open the pituitary and resect the tumor on this transnasal approach. Mm -hmm. This is great. Um, usually, for many people, this works. You have these like straight instruments, little carats, and an endoscope that you would push forward and then be able to resect the tumor. Now, our idea was that a continuum robot could greatly improve the ability to reach these pituitary tumors through the sphenoid sinus in such anatomical and pathological situations where these standard straight instruments would have a hard time. You could also think about if the tumor extends a little bit more into the brain, you would uh, really benefit from a tool that could curve around here and help you resect this tumor. So that was the idea behind. And so we used these concentric tube robots that we saw earlier and employed a teleoperation scheme. So the physician, this was a collaborator of mine when I was still at Vanderbilt University a couple of years back, um, he uses this input device. He has endoscope vision because the endoscope is brought forward with the robot instrument. And here we are using the skull uh, phantom. And so he's seeing the endoscopic view, and this is the continuum robot tool, and he would just lead the robot through the, um, through the application. And so we developed this robot prototype and used it in some ex vivo uh, experiments and showed the feasibility of um, concentric tube continuum robots for this type of, of approach. Now, unfortunately, this has never gone any further, so there's no medical product um, as of today. But this was very exciting because I believe that this is still an application which really showcases the, the simple and yet effective use of a slightly curved uh, robot um, in a medical application. Now, not all of the research ends up um, being stuck on the bench top as this one. Um, there's a lot of commercial continuum robots, in fact, and I'm showcasing four very prominent types here on this slide. On the upper side, we see interventional uh, continuum robots that are either used through the vasculature, for example, robotically steered catheters are in fact continuum robots. When you think about multiple catheters and guide wires, they're incentively concentrically oriented and you translate and rotate on the back end. So this is a continuum robot that uses the um, vasculature to uh, reach steering. For example, most applications are um, within cardiac interventions, but there's also a push towards neurovascular interventions. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, later when I talk about one of my uh, collaborations. On the other side here, we see robotic bronchoscopy. So this is also a concentric tube continuum robot system that is teleoperated using this like handheld uh, device here, which um, is also rotated and translated on the back end. And then it enters through the bronchi into deeper regions within the lung. So this is a system that was um, commercialized by Oros Health. And then down here, we see um, surgical continuum robots. Here, this is a system by Intuitive Surgical, the same manufacturer as the one from the Da Vinci robot. And they built this Da Vinci single port robot. When you look closely, so this is going through a single port into the abdomen. These instruments here are continuum instruments, right? So they are curving. So they get a better triangulation in this very constrained entrance pathway. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, work we're seeing. And then the camera, this is a, um, a stereoscopic um, endoscope. And then down here, we see an example of a not yet commercialized system. This is used for endoscopic uh, surgery. It's um, from the company Virtuoso Surgical. My former postdoc advisor is the CEO of that company. And so they use these concentric tube continuum robots. They are very small. So you may be able to tell here, these are the tubes we saw earlier, this uh, telescoping tubes that come out of this. Uh, it's a urethroscope in this case, because this is supposed to be used in transurethral prostate surgery. So the continuum robots would carry little laser fiber and small incision tools to resect the prostate uh, tumor. And I believe the system is up for FDA approval, and we'll get to see if this ends up uh, being useful to a patient. 
But overall, um, I would say it's very exciting that a lot of the continuum robotics research that's been around for about 20 years has also moved into commercial medical uh, continuum robots. Now, it's important to note, these are all fully teleoperated. None of these robots is acting autonomously in any sense, right? It's always an input device and the physician directly commanding what the robot is doing. So in the remainder of the lecture, I would now like to talk about the next generation of continuum robots in medicine. And before we start off with this, I would like us to talk a little bit about um, levels of autonomy and what does that actually mean? So I think a common misunderstanding uh, is often when we talk about medical robots is that the public perception would be that the robots would replace a physician, that they would be fully autonomous in doing something that um, is fully of an AI, um, or commanded by an AI. And yet the, the truth is that all currently employed uh, medical robot systems have in fact no autonomy as we discovered earlier. These systems are controlled manually and follow the user's uh, commands. Um, on a spectrum of autonomy levels, uh, we call this level zero autonomy. So if we, um, if we thought about, well, how would this look like if we moved up all the way to level five, the highest level of autonomy? Um, there's actually quite a bit of research that would be needed in order to have such systems, robotic systems in the operating room. Now, this is a very nice um, um, autonomy level visualization that was published in Science Robotics a few uh, years back that I'm, I'm happy to reuse here because it shows well that down here at level zero, it's fully the physician in control. And then you see the robot appearing with different opacity all the way up until the robot is fully autonomously performing an intervention. You can see level zero is no autonomy, level one robot assistance, level two task autonomy, where the robot performs certain operator initiated task autonomously. So the physician would still say now this one task, and then the robot does a little piece. And then we move up to level three, which would be conditional autonomy. The system generates task strategies, but still relies on a user to select what is the best strategy to move forward in surgery. Up to high autonomy, where that would be level four, the robot can make decisions, but need to be under the supervision of a fully qualified user in case something goes wrong and the user has to take over. Up to full autonomy, there's no human operator needed and the robot could perform the entire task autonomously. Now, to the best of my knowledge, any medical robot, surgical robot system is down here. And I have not seen any level three, four, five uh, system out in the wild. And that's why I'm talking about the next generation and how this relates to continuum robots, which are uh, my specialty. So I would like to take you on a journey on what we are doing in my lab to think about how can we increase the autonomy level based on what we have. So we have the modeling, we have the motion planning, we have the teleoperation scheme. And now what would need to change for us to move up this autonomy ladder? So increasing autonomy means if we revisited this control scheme that we saw earlier, remember we had the leader, the physician commanding with an input device and the robot just following. Now, for us to increase the autonomy, we will need to close the loop in a different way. We will not close the loop by the observation of the physician or by the leader, but we would need to close the loop with some other sensed quantities um, to gain information about what is happening, not only with the robot, but probably also with the patient. But I'm going to focus on what the robot is doing for the remainder of the talk. Um, and we'll talk towards the very end about uh, all sorts of other sensing that we would need. And by increasing the autonomy, there is this interaction between the leader, the physician, multiple physicians, and an AI. And there's hopefully this like hand in hand work of the two as the autonomy level increases. So first I wanna talk about this um, real time perception down here. So we will need to be able to understand what is our robot actually doing, not based on observation by a physician, but by some sensing. And this is where one of the challenges lie in continuum robotics in how can we actually in real time, meaning in just millisecond intervals, understand what is the robot doing within the patient? Meaning how is the shape of this robot? Where is the tip? Where is it in relation to, um, to the body? 
we have different sensing means available to us in uh, medicine, apart from medical imaging, which may not be real time. Um, we have electromagnetic tracking, which can give us discrete pose measurements, meaning we know the position and orientation of our um, sensing coil, which are very small. And you can tell the small scale sensing coil here can be well integrated into a continuum robot. Yet, as it's a, an electromagnetic system, it is prone to um, disturbances and disturbances and distortion from any ferromagnetic material. The same may hold in a in an MRI operating room. So this this could be used, but there's some uh, issues with it in terms of the update rate and the the complexity of of the environment. Then we have optical strain sensors that are essentially optical fibers, which have fiber break gratings in it that. Um, can if they are experiencing a strain, meaning if the robot is bent, the refracted wavelengths would change. And we from this um, wavelength shift, we can reason about the strain. And from the strain, we can reason about the shape of a continuum robot. These are amazing sensors, but quite expensive. Um, so we recently bought one for the research lab, and it's about 100K with all the components involved. And if you think about a medical product that needs the sensor integrated into it to be useful, I'm having a hard time imagining what a continuum robot would actually cost if it included an FPG sensing system, so this optical strain measurement. So we're kind of um, at a point where we need to decide, well, what is a good sensing system at a reasonable cost in a medical application? And so oftentimes we are trying to explore vision because that usually comes at no extra cost in minimally invasive surgery. You usually have um, a small scale endoscopic, laparoscopic uh, camera with you, or you could integrate it into the continuum robot and move with it as you will probably always want to have visual sight of the, um, of the target. So that's about the perception aspect. So I'm not going to go into depth on the specialities about these different uh, sensing methods. I just want to raise your awareness that because these robots are so small, integrating sensing methods with it is actually not that straightforward. And that's often a, a challenge we're facing. So but let's assume we have the sensing uh, capabilities. So we can actually know where the robot is based on sensing here. And we can close the loop. And now it's coming about, well, how can we increase the autonomy levels? And I want to go on one example. So this has been a work that we have been doing with um, a collaborator in France, um, where we worked on dual arm coordination. So we have a dual arm continuum robot um, coming out of an endoscope or a laparoscope. So we have these two arms. And the idea here is to increase the level of autonomy from pure teleoperation to providing assistance in controlling these dual arm continuum robots. Um, and the way we realize this is, uh, don't get, it, it looks daunting, but um, let's, let's focus on it from a high level. So in a sense, what I'm showing here is the same teleoperation loop that we saw earlier. So this is pretty much the, the task that the robot is uh, performing. It gets a desired tip velocity input from the leader. So that's the input from the physician. And then this control loop, it looks a little bit more uh, complex because there's a, a higher level of detail here that I was emitting earlier, but let's ignore this for, for a moment. And then there's sensing here. This would be electromagnetic tracking coils in this sense. So there's some sensing happening. And then there's the second block this turquoise one, which help in attaining this assistance. So the robot could, for example, deploy a secondary task, which is the assistance task, while it is following the primary goal of doing what the user is commanding. And so I'm going to give you an example of how that, how that could look like. For example, in this dual arm system, you uh, may, for example, have the desire to um, support the physician. So to operate a dual arm system, you would need to have two input devices. So the physician would need to operate both robots at the same time. Now let's assume there's a very tedious task and you want the physician to focus on this primary arm that they, for example, want to do a very um, delicate incision with or some, some very complicated task. And the second robot may carry 
an additional tool like a suction tool or um, an imaging procedure. And you would want the second arm just to follow the motion of the first one with a prescribed distance. So following this pass could be realized by increasing the level of autonomy. So you're saying one arm is fully teleoperated and the second arm is following the motion of the first. This is providing you with some assistance in the intervention. And we were showing here, at least on the bench top, that one which carries this red marker here and the blue marker, that the blue marker would be following the motion of the red marker, which is described by a physician. So this is an easy way to gain um, level one robot assistance autonomy uh, in a clinical setting. The same may hold if the primary arm is teleoperated and the second arm would need to attain a certain predefined view angle to the first one. Let's assume the, the second arm is carrying an endoscope, an endoscopic camera, and you want a nice view onto what the first arm is doing. And so that would also be a robot assistance, so level one autonomy, even though we're still following a very simple teleoperation scheme and the physician would still be in uh, full control. So there's some very exciting work, I believe, that um, brings in some level of autonomy at a very um, understood and well-defined um, task. Now, if we want to reach higher levels of autonomy, I'm going to talk about one example that we did a while back and exploit a bit what that means and what we could do with it. So some of you may be able to tell this is, uh, again, a similar uh, teleoperation control scheme, except here we are actually closing the loop by vision. We have a microscopic camera in the sense. So there's a microscope, for example, in a neurosurgical application, the physician would operate under a surgical microscope. And then we have this uh, concentric tube continuum robot here. And this is just to visualize the benchtop. So the robot would be visible in the endoscopic view. So we could use the images that we gain to use image reconstruction, 3D reconstruction, to reason about where is the robot in these images. We did this um, in collaboration with uh, Professor Kars. Um, back then he was still in Hanover. Now he's here at uh, University of Toronto and also a member of, of TKRM. And so they did the vision aspect of this task. So they reconstruct the 3D scene. This is a 3D reconstruction from the microscope. And then they would use this um, to tell our control loop, where is the tip of the robot? And we would put a desired tip position in. For example, here on these pieces of chicken breast, we mark these green locations. And these were the desired positions for the robot to autonomously move to. So that would be um, task autonomy. The robot moves automatically to a prescribed position in this, um, in this case. And then using this visual servering approach, the robot is able to move to these positions without any user input. And the accuracy was quite remarkable. So we got to these positions with an error below 0.2 millimeters. So super accurate um, by just closing the loop through sensing. Now you may say, okay, this is a chicken breast, all nice, this works well, but what would this be used for? I, I don't see it. So let's think about some surgical scenarios where this could be useful. So think about the physician performing a, a very complex neurosurgical uh, um, tumor resection task. And you had this additional third hand, the robot, available to you. For example, to repeatedly get um, an optical coherence tomography sensor or a small imaging probe to the very same location to check for margins. Or think about this third arm carrying a suction tool and you are, for example, uh, doing... Um, I don't know, let's say cochleostomy, you're like performing a mastoidectomy and you're um, resecting the bone in the, of the mastoid and you have to like have this irrigation fluid and there will be bleeding and this third hand could be your automatic suction tool. So it could move to locations where you determine liquid accumulation and automatically um, remove the liquid while the physician could focus on the task at hand, um, which requires the most um, attention. So this is all great because it already gets us, as you may see, easily to this level two autonomy, some task autonomy. A robot could help in a scenario where the physician is still under full control. And this is kind of where we're moving um, with the next generation of, of continuum robots to, to attain some levels of autonomy from a roboticist's perspective. And by looking at the time, I'm gonna um, now wrap up our, uh, our lecture today. 
um, because continuum robots are very exciting for um, potential use in medicine. Um, I would have hoped that there was more uptake in uh, in medical products to date, and yet this takes time, right? Research takes time to move into into reality, and it mostly moves through um, highly qualified personnel, through PhD students and postdocs that we train that end up in medical um, uh, robotics companies. But it also, I think, uh, there's another maybe challenge that the continuum robotics research community is facing, in that you need very specialized um, engineering knowledge and computer science knowledge to understand how these robots work. And that's a challenge because I think I personally have done research in this space for about 15 years now. So we are one of the world leading labs. We have all these robots that we built ourselves. Like you cannot buy these continuum robots. So everything we do in the research lab starts with designing a robot, building a robot, doing research with it. So it's actually quite tedious. And if you want to get into the space, the, the learning curve is actually quite uh, quite shallow and it actually takes a long time to get to the point where you can do meaningful research. So a year ago, we started the Open Continuum Robotics uh, project. It's on this website where we write blog posts that are educational for people entering this field, trying to understand what is the difference of continuum robots and stuff. We're also providing open software and open hardware for knowledge mobilization to help accelerate medical robotics innovation with continuum robotics. And I want to talk about one success story of this project um, at the end of my talk, which is a very amazing uh, collaboration that we have with uh, Dr. Pereira, who is a neurosurgeon here at St. Michael's Hospital and director of the Radis Lab. I believe also a TCARA member, and I believe he has also spoken to you um, at some point. So Vitor is... Um, for those who know him, he's very dedicated to endovascular uh, procedures. He's a true neuroendovascular robotics pioneer. He was the first to use a catheter steering robot, the Corinda system that we saw earlier today, that was intended for cardiovascular interventions in neurovascular interventions to treat, um, for example, stroke. And he performed the very first robot-assisted neurointerventional procedure in Canada. And so from Vito, I learned that stroke is obviously a very time dependent condition. Vito always says, well, uh, time is brain. So if you have a stroke, um, you would want to get um, to the hospital immediately. And that is actually a challenge when you live in a place like Canada and your um, your great uh, physician that can treat you is located in Toronto. And yet your stroke happens somewhere up here um, in a more rural location. And so it is uh, Vitor's vision that you could use this robotically steered catheter that he has was in the operating room and the patient is right next to him, but over larger distances so that your wherever your stroke happens, you could be treated from a specialist, for example, in Toronto. And so we are collaborating with Vitor on this space. And so you would argue, well, there exists a catheter steering robot, so you could just use this. And yet that is not true, because if you do research in this realm and want to understand what are the requirements of a remote intervention, you will need a test robot, a test bench, where you have full access to everything. You would want to have full access to the control, to all the data, to everything this robot is producing. And this may not be the case in a uh, commercial product that you're using. So using the Open Continuum Robotics project, our co-supervised student, that is Thais up here, she does a master's in mechanical engineering. She was able to robotic to engineer this robotically steered catheter system from our Open Continuum Robotics hardware. And now this system is used to understand better, well, what are the requirements in remote stroke treatment? And this is uh, quite uh, remarkable. And I want to invite you, if you're excited about Continuum Robots and may want to use it in medical interventions, check out the Open Continuum Robotics project. Um, and I'm excited about where this uh, leads in the future with, uh, with uh, Vitor and his uh, and his team. So this is a very nice um, collaboration that we recently um, started. So to wrap us up, um, I guess I've spoken to you about Continuum Robots. I believe you have an understanding now of what Continuum Robots are, how we can use them in a teleoperated setting at this level zero autonomy, and how we can move up to robot assistance and task autonomy quite easily from a robotics perspective. What I haven't quite talked about is, well, how can we reach these higher levels of autonomy? And I think that's where places like TKRM come into play, where we are all working together from different um, areas with different domain knowledge um, in order to understand how can we get to an autonomous robotic agent in an operating theater. This may be nothing we see in the next couple of years, but maybe something we aim for in 20 years or in 25 years. 
And you can probably see that the work that I'm doing as a roboticist is very much focused on the robot, which is on algorithms, motion planning, control, state estimation, all the stuff that roboticists do. And yet what we need to get these robots into the operating room is much more. We need to understand the domain in which we're operating in. Every different medical application is slightly different. We have different um, yeah, anatomical constraints, different um, procedures at hand. We, for an autonomous agent, we will need to be able to understand what are the user intentions of the physician if it comes to assistance task, or what is the ultimate high level planning of a full procedure such that uh, an NI controlled, a fully autonomous agent could perform it. We need to get much better in reasoning and planning, and this goes way beyond what I can do as a roboticist. So that's really where interdisciplinary challenges come into play and where TKRM is really a great facilitator. So with this, I um, would like to thank those people that actually do the research uh, that I have been fortunate enough to talk about. These are all PhD students um, currently working with me in the lab. That was uh, the summer when we had our uh, summer excursion. And it's really their work that I talk about. So I'm very grateful to a set of great minds and passionate researchers um, supporting the Continuum Robotics Lab and also the funding that we receive from NSERC, um, from uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Ontario Research Fund, as well as the University of Toronto in general. With that, I am happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you, Dr. Werner kars uh, So we'll take any questions. If you could just leave them in the Q&A, uh, I'll go through them. Um, so the first one is uh, by Beza. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Thank you. Transphenoidal surgery is pretty common in neuro. Why did the continuum robot for this particular purpose not get beyond the bench? What are its limitations? Also wondering the cost effectivity contribution of continuum robots in current clinical uses. Other than better reach, better position, do these systems contribute at all to the ultimate cost effectively of surgical procedure, vice versa? Oh, very good questions. Uh, I'm going to go with the first one. Why didn't move beyond the bench? Um, I wish I knew. Um, I think we showed that it would work ex, ex vivo uh, very well. It did not move to any animal studies, probably for the lack of funding. I also got to be uh, transparent. So this was work that I did while I was a postdoc at Vanderbilt University and I left. So after I left, I obviously personally was not uh, contributing to this research project anymore. Um, it's probably funding issues. And uh, I believe also, you know, there are not that many cases where the transphenoidal access is impossible with straight instruments. So maybe the market is not big enough to push this beyond the benchtop, right? It's often, as you, as you um, indicate with the second part of the question, it's all about cost effectivity. And so maybe this was not the best use case. And I think that's why some of the research has been moving to this. Uh, I, we talked a little, barely about this commercial, on the verge of commercialization transurethral system, like in euro um, and prostate resection, the need um, may be higher and there may be more cost effectiveness. That's often, um, I think, a challenge that we're facing as medical roboticists uh, on the side of the benchtop if we're not in the clinic and uh, dependent on on collaborators. Sometimes we get these very excited collaborators talking about this very tedious one problem they saw, and we put a bunch of research into this direction. And then eventually we'll find out, well, there's maybe one in a thousand cases where this may be the case or, or even less. And then there is not really a good pitch you could make to a medical device company. Um, that's one thing. I hope this addresses your question. And then you also say cost effectivity in, in general. This is a very good point, right? That's often also hindering um, medical robotics moving into operating rooms. I think, honestly, even until today, there has been no actual study showing that the Da Vinci system, the medical robotic system, um, or the, the surgical robot um, has proven to be more effective in treating the disease. It's a nice tool, and I think it can reduce minimally invasiveness, but a very good laparoscopic physician may be able to do the same thing. Um, so yeah, that's a that's an interesting um, discussion. Um, I think that would be worthwhile having. So thanks for the question. Thank you. And the next question, I think, has to do with the scale of these uh, continuum robots in terms of can they be as small as being able to look at specific genes and um, uh, 
being able to perform CRISPR in this case. Yeah, uh, interesting. No, I think if we wanted to do things at the gene level or at that that super small scale, this robot would certainly be too big. Like they are small, as you can tell, like from the slide that I'm displaying here for the Q&A. This is the concentric tube continuum robot. And you may recall this was the smallest we can do. It's a few millimeters at its tip. So that's still probably too large for, for doing any gene manipulation. Then you get into the area and there's a realm of micro robotics. There's a couple of colleagues here at the University of Toronto and also at other places that do micro robots that are really small, which would be addressing these kind of problems. But continuum robots, no, the smallest we can do is this, is this um, honestly. Thank you. And Hamza said, amazing work. Thanks for the presentation. Maisa said, thank you. And uh, I guess I have one final question myself. Um, I was wondering in terms of the design uh, of continuum robots, um, have biological systems or natural systems kind of had an inspiration on the design of some of these things? And have they translated into technical innovations at any point? Yeah, very good question, Abby. Uh, for sure. Yeah, the, I haven't talked about this today um, for the lack of time. But yes, certainly, I think continuum robots were greatly inspired by the animal kingdom, like some of the early work um, that dates back to the 60s. Um, the elephant trunk was a very big uh, influencer in just looking at the motion of an elephant trunk, its extension, contraction, like all these motion primitives I was talking about are also visible in, um, for example, an elephant trunk. You, We also look at tongues, for example, an anteater tongue or the the tongue of um, pretty much any, um, this is, is like a very nice example of this like motion behaviors that we would ultimately want to see in, in robotics, uh, earthworms, snakes, these are all informing um, continuum robotics research. Um, in terms of actuation, yeah, I think to some extent as well, we have um, seen research which uh, which tries to resemble the behavior of a muscular hydrostat by using some like, um, you know, pressure, change in pressure to extend, contract uh, pneumatic artificial muscles and all these sort of things are certainly present in larger scale continuum robots. Um, and then for the smaller scale, I guess we're trying to simplify the biological example. So with this tendon actuation, it's almost like you could, you could think of these tendons as muscle fibers and you're inducing uh, moments and stuff and they're attaching to certain aspects. So there's some of this um, biological inspiration, certainly uh, also moving into, into continuum robotics design inspirations. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Bergner Kars, uh, for the fascinating talk, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, and once again, the event is CPD accredited. So to obtain your CPD credit, um, there's a QR code and link on the last slide uh, here. And if you could fill that out, the certificate will be emailed to you. And please ensure that you provide us with your full name and email address uh, in that link. <clears throat> and please keep up to date by following us on Twitter and subscribing to our mailing list on our website, so t karamutronoca And if you're affiliated with any of TKRM's partner organizations, join our online community, the TKRM Hive. And we're now one of the biggest um, AI and medicine networks in the world, and uh, we want you to be a part of it. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you.